Well, how are we, gents? Jimmy, Tank, uh, hope you both had a good weekend. I've had a very busy weekend, which we'll come on to in a minute, and you can probably tell maybe by the sound of my voice. Uh, Jim, you were just telling us how uh, you're delighted with how pearly white your teeth look today. <laughs> I didn't say it. You said it, mate. <laughs> Not me. How are you, lad? You all right? Yeah, all good, mate. Good. You? The weekend? Good. You've got, and for the for the people that uh, can't see Jimmy and don't watch us on YouTube, talk us through your new addition to your tech setup there, lad. Oh, yeah, I bought one of these little sponge microphone things. <laughs> little red bell end there, yeah, right close like to you. A little, <laughs> it looks like the dog's lipstick when he gets a little bit horny and he pokes <laughs> out his little willy. So I've got multiple colours, so I'll, it'll change every week. Depending <laughs> on your mood, yeah, because we got a couple of comments this week on the on the Twitter profile asking if you are a Liverpool fan, but I can assure people you are definitely <laughs> yeah, no. not a Liverpool definitely fan. Definitely not, no. Yeah, no, I think that's we, fair to say. <laughs> yeah, we don't we <laughs> don't need any that. more of them. I don't know. There was a there's yeah. a couple of comments that came through just asking, does Jimmy support Liverpool? So yeah. I think, it, yeah, is that it, to go along with the guy who said I chat absolute shit? <laughs> yeah, that was me under a different <laughs> profile. Mate. I just wanted to send you some abuse. <laughs> Tank, a uh, round of applause, mate, for what was the greatest of Tank's facts before, um, live from uh, the track there. You've yeah. got to be happy with that one. Yeah, the only thing what never went down too well is I couldn't film drive and have Frankie on the track at the same time. I was going to say, where was Frankie? Did he get binned off today? He's heavily, heavily pissed off, to be honest with you. Tight that, mate. So, but um, that's a good fact, by the way, and I weren't aware of that. There's actually 55 miles separates mainland Russia and mainland America. Uh, real will, it, will it uh, ruin the illusion of your tank facts if I like I assume where do you get these from mate because you you reel that one don't off Google it. Let, Google let me, Google let me it. stop there listen this is called Google you don't need it it's in there but mate honestly I was astounded when I found that fact out because yeah, you always wrong. think they're like the opposite side of the country and they're literally they're there next to each other yeah, that yeah was, uh, you know, yeah. when you see a map, it's flat, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So it goes the other way. It's a, it's yeah, you don't really... realise that it wraps around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Flat Earth conspiracies. Uh, yeah, that's, exactly. yeah, that's one for another day. I reckon, I reckon you've got a bit of, bit of flat Earth in your tank. Yeah, tanks, all that. COVID is yeah. pigeons and robots. Mate. You're not pigeons and robots. Alexa, definitely... Alexa in your house, no. <laughs> They're listening. Oh, really? You wouldn't have Alexa? Mate, honestly, the kids have just bought the. There was the, Amazon done like a deal, didn't he? Amazon Day or something. Yeah, and Friday. Our, our, that's it. And our Jack and Millie both got these little Alexa ball things. Yeah. And I'm like, every time you go anywhere, it's like off unplugged. I'm not having them. The listener, mate. The listener. Th uh, uh, Tank thinks the bloody Bill Gates is the, uh, yeah. the other side of it, taking bro, all his shit. information. I'm telling you, mate. I'm telling you. Listening to be all your betting tips. <laughs> <laughs> That's where uh, he's yeah. getting his facts from, Bill Gates. That's it, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I have to, I have to explain me, uh, explain me dodgy voice because, uh, yeah, busy weekend for me. My, uh, I haven't seen my brother and his family, my niece, my nephew, and his, uh, my sister-in-law for, for over three years. And me, I knew they were up to something. I knew the missus and kids were up to something. And um, they told me that someone was coming to visit, but I'd convinced myself that it was someone completely different. I'd spoke to my brother the day before. He told me he was potentially going to the charity shield, was waiting on a ticket. So it just wasn't even in me, uh, even in my mind. I actually thought it was so, uh, a mate that was uh, over from America. No, I thought he friend. was coming. And uh, yeah, I was sat in the back garden and all of a sudden, I mean, you two have seen the video and Jim, you know that I'm a, I am love a good cry. Yeah, I, had a, I sobbed up a little bit. I'll be Did honest. you? Did it get yeah, you? Yeah, it'll get a little bit, yeah. Yeah, they, they come and surprise. My brother was there. My lip had gone. Uh, no, it was just, um, I drank far too much. Didn't get enough sleep. At one point on Saturday night, we had some of our friends over as well. It was time to go to bed. And there was not one bed or place for me to sleep in the house because there was just people everywhere. So I ended up in my drunken state, deciding that I would lie at the end of the bed on the floor with no duvet and a hoodie as a pillow. So you can imagine, <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine why I'm feeling this rough. Um, before, before we get into the footy, lads, because um, there's a couple of big games happening over the weekend, Jim Tank, what is the, the best and we worst surprise that you've ever been given? And I'll, I'll come to you first, Jim. I hate surprises. Absolutely despise them. Do you? Don't, yeah, don't. Is that a little bit of OCD control, kind yeah, of, you like to know I, what's coming? Yeah, and I like to tell people as well. So if I've bought presents, I have to tell them, I have to tell you what it is, or because I just can't, 
the suspense and the, all that sort of stuff is is um it's not good for me i don't i don't like it at all but i've had i guess i've had two good well i've had two and you can work out which is a good and which is a bad so um <laughs> for my 30th jamie you were yep, there turned up uh, that was a bit of a surprise so oh, we, thanks uh, i didn't think i'd be getting the old uh Getting the old nod there. As I said, good or bad, you you decide. <laughs> uh, we, we had a, we had a, all my mates in a little in a little cabin, and we had some stuff organised over the uh, over the weekend. So that was that was good, especially when when Jay comes over from from Ireland, and then um, the conceivement of my second child. I guess that was a bit of a surprise to me. Anyway, not not my wife. She was she had planned for it, but. And she assures me we had a conversation, but I don't remember it. Okay, so we'll leave the listeners to decide which one's which there, mate. <laughs> Tank, what about you? Mine's a bit, the same one is both good and bad, and it sounds a bit harsh, but it's actually true. It was Boxing Day, New Year's, New Year's Eve, sorry it was, and I'm sat in the pub with me. Dad took me old fella for a few pints down the road from ours, and I get a phone call off my missus crying saying you're going to have to come home, quick, come home. And I'm like, well, what's the matter? She went, Bill Gates he... has been listening to our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and she's gone, come on, bear in mind, it's like, you know, I'm 40 at this stage. And she said, you need to come home. I went, I'm not coming home. She said, tell me what's the matter. And she said, I'm pregnant. Jeez. And I was like, my response probably, you know, I thought it was a fair response. I was like, you can fuck that off. Put the phone <laughs> down and told me dad to get the shots in. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of them where you know I had two kids who were grow, growing up, and then at forty one, I was uh, were pregnant again. So yeah, it was both good. And, it was both good and bad. Little, yeah, yeah, little, 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 little Frankie yeah. lad. Yeah, there you go. So, right so, the end. Yeah, it was uh, okay. So lads, football, right? So I want to start off with well, we, we can't not mention it because obviously there's a couple of big games over the weekend, but I want to start off with sending our congratulations to England's Lionesses, who um had a famous win last night. Firstly, it was an unbelievable spectacle. I, I did watch it. Um I, I thought it was great to see the reaction in the crowd, uh, the, the stories that were coming off the back of the win, real feel good. Off the back of my emotional weekend, anyway, I was all over the place last night. So <laughs> anything was sending me over the edge. But now, Jim, it was it was great to see, wasn't it? Um, unbelievable spectacle, and, and for a sport where women have probably had to fight a fair bit to get noticed and get a bit of attention, it was good to see them have that moment. Yeah, unbelievable. I'll, I'll admit that I didn't I didn't see the game. I was, but what I will say is that um, I was playing footy myself, and after the match, I was eager to get in the car, got it on Talk Sport listening to it i was actually wanting it to go to penalties so i could see some of the game yeah yeah not because i didn't want them to win just my own selfish reasons as i wanted to watch some of it luckily i got back with i think three minutes to go so um got to see them um got to see them you know manage the game out and and do really well and then you know the celebrations at the end are unbelievable and um you know it's it's great to see the, the the female game and and this should hopefully take it through the through the stratosphere especially within England anyway and it'll be a shame if it doesn't because you know what more can they do on that point tank I mean we've we've spoken about this and, and I thought we handled it relatively well because we all have opinions on uh, you know uh, the the women's game and maybe what needs to happen and the, and the narratives that come out around it but what, what I would say is we obviously all want the best for, for the women's game and, and to open up those pathways for young kids to get involved do you think that this will have an impact you know encouraging young girls to get into it or whether it's schools to put women's football on the curriculum and just make sure that we're really pushing and, and getting women playing I think it's got to I mean I I, I didn't see the game I've seen about 20 minutes um and I seen the first goal and the girl. I mean, it was a fantastic finish. To be fair, uh, I think it, this this needs to give a push for you know the, the main thing for this is that young girls need to be able to come out and you know if they enjoy football, they play football. There's got to be a platform for them. Um, this shouldn't go. You know, it, it's a it's a big thing. What what the lionesses have done. It, it's brilliant. Don't get me wrong. I've seen some of the celebrations on Sky and everything this morning, um, and it's fantastic. And I hope that they do build on it. You know, I have my opinions on where the game can, can go. 
as supposed, you know, compared to the men's and it can't get anywhere near that because the quality is not there. But what I do hope is that young girls coming through from the age of six to seven, they'll be out in the street. You know, you see the kids with the girl who scored the back heel goal and it's brilliant. And I do hope the game goes from strength to strength. As I say, I have an opinion where it's never going to go anywhere near the men's game because the product is nowhere near that level, never will be. Um, but I just hope that they use this platform to build and grow and grow and get the best product that they possibly can. Do you think that, Jim, is just because, you know, there was obviously uh, well-documented women were stopped playing football for, uh, for for a long period of time and obviously then they haven't had that coaching and time to develop and play. Do you think it is just because of because of that that it's so far behind or do you have aspirations of them of them catching up, I suppose, with the men? No, I think you're absolutely spot on. If, you, if, if we were to start anything now, if it's in the line of something else or it's, you know, adjacent to something that has been going for hundreds of years you're always going to be behind that line of business aren't you because that's just that's just the nature of it. What this, yeah this is what what this will do is this will be getting more girls out there this will be getting more coaches interested in female football this so then when people are starting at six and seven that's when you know come they turn uh, 18 19 and turning pro they're technically going to be better if you're starting football at 15 and turning pro at 22 for a female you haven't had that longevity have you so i think this will then you know the tides the tide uh, tides have changed turn slowly so i think this will start getting them out early getting that technical ability in the game should will will progress because of it can i wasn't going to throw this in but we try to be as honest as we can on this podcast we're not we don't have sponsors involved or anyone trying to like clip our heels well Thank you for doing very well. To be fair, we, we have we, we we have not dropped any controversial shouts. I think yet it's going to be a long season, but we're doing all right. Yeah. But we, at the same time, we don't want to filter stuff, and we try to be as honest and respectful as we can. The only thing I still have a slight issue with is the quality of the keepers. And yeah. I wanted to ask you your opinion. And again, I'm, look, I'm open to discussing this, and if people have strong opinions against this or think I'm being disrespectful, I'm not trying to be. Do you think Tank? With the some of the keepers, I would say that I've seen are, are not very not to the required level. I would say, do you not think that maybe smaller goals could potentially improve the quality? In that, I've seen some shots go in, and you're looking at it thinking, yeah, it looks a good strike, but in reality, that should probably be saved. Or do you think it's just people are happy because they get to see loads of goals? No, it's. <laughs> It's you can't. I think for today's society in the world we live in today, if someone mentioned smaller goals, mate, you'd be you know all of these woke people that jump all over you. But they, they do need smaller goals because I personally believe that ninety nine percent of the goals what go in in the women's football would not go in if there was like a professional man keeping it. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it was the I seen the goals. I, th I think it was the Sweden game where the keeper got chipped and the keeper got four hands on it and it still went in. <laughs> I mean, she got that much of a clear hand on it. You're like, that, that, that can't go in. Mm. That, these can't go in. I, I do agree with you about the quality of the keepers. It, it's it's poor to say the least. Mm. Um, and you might you might have something there where you know you reduce the size of the goal, both height wise and width ways. I think you know it. It'd make it a bit of a better spectrum because the th the issue with I with Jamie is that the, there's lots of goals going in, but when I'm watching it, I'm like, how's that gone in? And yeah. it kind of makes me want to switch off a bit and just like, I can't watch this. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the keepers go down in monthly instalments as well. Um, <laughs> so I'm with you on that, but you try putting that into into the powers that be and they jump all over you. The reason I said it, Jim, is. You know what? Because I, I I put the parallels towards kids' games when kids yeah. start, right? And yeah. again, I'm not I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. But when you start as a kid, you know as well as I do. You both would have played grown up. When we moved to big pitches far too early, and we had the massive goals, and you had a big fat lad at the back who, or I'm allowed to say fat, right? So a big fat lad who kicked the ball ball up front. Right, you're not you're not mentioning anyone specific, mate, unless no, you're looking at tank. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I actually want to come on to that in a minute. You reminded me. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Let's get your top off, and I'll get mine off. Hey, hey, come on, Pinky. Let's have a look. Uh, but they would. They'd have a big lad at the back who boomed the ball forward, a fast lad up front, and then he did it 
two or three yards left or right of the keeper and it goes in because you've got massive goals and big pitches. Nobody is developing as a footballer. So there was a concerted effort to put kids on smaller pitches, smaller goals, and it develops the technical ability required to help them get to where they need to be. So, Jim, do you not think that there's something in that that it will just help the women develop a more technical side to their goalkeeping, to their football? I don't know. I... There's, there's nothing you can do about genetics, is there? That's that's the issue you've got here, is that, you know, females are just genetically smaller than, than men. And the pool of players that are currently in the female game will be small compared to blokes, you know. Whereas before, you'd be able to get, uh, you know, blokes will see six foot two goalies being brought in and turned into a keeper. Whereas at the minute, you've probably got one or two in the female game that you've got to choose from. So... I think that would, again, this will change with time. The more females playing, the more, um, you know, the more exposure to it, they will come and then they will, um, they will, they will genetically be more astute to who they need in what positions. So, yes, smaller goals will make it easier for them. Of course it will, but. I don't think that's the answer. And I don't think that that is the end game here. I think the end game is getting more people involved to be have a bigger pool of people to choose from, as opposed to making it easier for a smaller pool of, of, of um, select few. Now I want to, I'm going to come back to, to the weight thing just super quick before we dive into the charity shield. Thank you. Put up a post over the weekend, mate. Uh, you've what been on man. your own fitness, uh, fitness, journey mental and physical fitness uh kind of front of mind for you over uh, over the last few weeks and uh you're looking great mate in that photo that you put up tell the tell the listeners a little bit about that oh just you know you just kind of you get yourself in that mindset where you just kind of like i'll start monday yeah and i've been in that like you know for 12 months and i just i don't know why you just kind of like i'm not mentally at it or you know, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not like down to you, but I'm just not in the mental mindset to to get off me lazy ass. And it was only Jack's prom. Honestly, that picture, it's from the 8th of July. It was Jack's prom. And uh, we were just in the garden and we missed it. Just got a picture with you and Jack. And you know, when I seen the picture on my phone, I was like, fucking hell. Mm. You know, that's, that's not me, that, you know. And I just thought, right, that's it. So that was the Friday. Um and the Saturday morning, it was just like, that's it. Uh, you know, I got on a Peloton bike. I got me, my daughter, Millie, who does her own little fitness thing. She's got her own little, uh, she sets her own little business up. She's doing really well for herself. She's brilliant. Um, she suffered with a mental health, Millie, and she had an eating disorder and everything. And she's been, she's public about it. And she, what she's transformed herself into is like, you know, it's phenomenal. As parents, it was, you know, worrying and sick what she was going through three years ago. And mm. the difference in there now was just phenomenal. So she just put me on like a calorie deficit thing where you eat so many calories a day and the right foods and not even so much the right foods. It's just kind of like you just don't go over your calories a day. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't eat shite, but I was just eating a lot of just picking, just going into like, the, like she, we've got the old fashioned pants. You just go to pants, you just grab a packet of crisp and there's a bar of chocolate and there's a can of Coke and then. You know, I was just not not eating right not or eating living aware. right. Yeah. yeah, and you just kind of like... So when I started doing the calorie stuff, I was like, Jesus, I must have been having about 5,000 calories a day without yeah. even thinking about it. So I just stopped it, and within, literally within three weeks, I've dropped uh, two stone, four pounds. Um, in, lad. And I just smashed the bike out, and it's just... I think we all have it. Like, what about the peloton, stuff. though? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just think because with the peloton, you just kind of because it, you're in a competition, so you've got the screen and you're in a competition, and you kind of I think the sportsman in us, the mentality yeah, is you know you're, you're trying to win and you, you're against people and I do forty five minutes every day, five days out of the week, and eating right, and that's the result. And the comeback is on now. The boots are getting dusted off out the old yeah, uh, out the uh, attic. Do you know what, mate? I wish, but the knees are absolutely shot to pieces. <laughs> I tried to kick a ball with our Frankie yesterday, and then nearly collapsed. And I've only, only done a five-yard pass. My knees are shot. So I was going to say, we've got a couple of over 35s teams. I could do it. slot you in, mate. Slot you in. Number 10 yeah. role in behind yeah. the striker, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, lads. But I want to come to, to the charity shield. Um, and I suppose... The Liverpool fans on this podcast, I will try to remain impartial. Uh, Tank won't, and Jimmy is not a Liverpool fan, so he can give us maybe the, the less uh, red uh, uh, red view on this. Um, 
I'll start post result and I put out a tweet pre game um, asking the question Does the trophy really matter? And I'll come to you first, Jim. Does the Charity Shield trophy matter? Well, I asked a question in the group text, didn't I? In our text before the game, I said, you know, is this a glorified friendly? Is it good to get one over the enemy? And I was in thinking about it. And I guess each team will have a different answer. And I, that depends on the result. So I think if Liverpool lose, everyone says it's a glorified friendly. I think if Liverpool win, everyone says it's good to get. And I think City are, are obviously the same. If they win, they they say it's great to, to get a win in early. And um, I think if they lose, uh, it's, you know, it's a glorified friendly. What I will say is that... Um, City look obviously come in the, into this very very rusty and and you know they're not they weren't at it and they didn't look at it where Liverpool looked on fire from the from um, from the get go. But I think that's been Pep's plan and I, I've, I've been meaning to look at the stats fans out there. I, did, who won last <laughs> that year? Man, Jim is back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who, I, I, I was going to see if City won it last year because I remember, I distinctly remember last year thinking. Wow, these city are struggling here. They're no never going to win the league, but then obviously they pick up their momentum and then they're always finished strong. So, yeah, I think it's it's. I think the result and the meaning of it depends on the team that wins, I guess. So, as the uh, as a fan of the team that won it, tank does the does the trophy matter? I think it. Yeah, it's. I think it it does matter. You know, it's another trophy. You know. But it's kind of like a 50-50 one for me where it's not the end of the world if you get beat. It's nice if you win. Obviously, City and Liverpool are huge rivals, so it's kind of like a little psychological edge, if you like, but a minute psychological edge. Um, yeah, but listen, it's a trophy, and I just think it's a, it's mainly... I look at the Charity Shield as the last really serious friendly before the season. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny one because I, I looked at that and I think you you touched on something there, Jim. Uh, I was chatting to Callum Walsh, um, who's uh, ex-head of performance at Newcastle. I was chatting to him only this morning and he was saying that City have, um, have only had, I think it's 120 minutes so far uh, in, in, yeah, in pre-season. So you, you, I think you're right, Jim. I think you could see that Liverpool, Liverpool were further along in their preparation and I said the same when Liverpool got beat comfortably by Manchester United. You could see that Manchester United were comfortably ahead of Liverpool in, in their prep. Um, and I, I kind of looked at the game yesterday. There was, there was a few narratives that kind of struck me. Um, I don't think you can t take too much from this game into the season in in the fact of where City are in their preparation. But there's a couple of things that struck me. Um, and I want to come to, to you lads on this. First of all, is these two teams are not going away anywhere anytime soon, Jim. And we got a, we got a question that came in on the Twitter profile um, and it was from Hawks Bay and he asked, does the boot room see this as another 90 plus point season? And do you think Jim given, because I was, I was, I have to say I was very impressed with both teams city given their lack of games, Liverpool look bang at it and ready to go for, for the season, to be honest. Um, do you think that these two teams could be looking at similar levels? Do you think it's sustainable and realistic? Absolutely, I do. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't see anything that tells me otherwise. Um, the only thing that, I, if I was worried from a city point of view, was that Haaland didn't look very connected to his players, mm -hmm. to to his fellow players. But that will come with time. Um, you know, he was. I, I, I again, I text text you boys saying that I don't know who the female commentator was, but she was talking around Haaland making runs and. There were balls that weren't being played into him, and and they just weren't used to his movement, which is fine. Look, it's it's new players, new teams, and that's going to come. So, do I think it could be another ninety point season? Yeah, absolutely, it could be. Why why wouldn't it be? And and the only I don't see anyone strengthening that well to try and challenge that. I mean, there's been some good signings, but um, but yeah, I think City and Liverpool are going to be by far and beyond anyone else. Tank, Jimmy makes a couple of interesting points there. I see so many parallels. So, so just in general, this Nunes versus Haaland, Haaland for City, Nunes for Liverpool. There's there's actually a lot of parallels in terms of maybe 
their their stature as a player, both traditional number nines, Liverpool and City. Um, while City like to dominate the ball, Liverpool are, are more kind of full throttle. I think they've developed a little bit. They're not as heavy metal as they used to be under Klopp. They do like to keep yeah. the ball a bit more. But the transition for both these players into their respective teams, it's actually... It's following similar paths. So Jimmy said there, Haaland didn't look particularly connected, but why the hell would he? I think you're dead why right. He's only, yeah, why would you? You've only played two, two, less than two games. But it was exactly the same and is still the same with Nunes. When the Cabbages online were questioning Nunes with the compilation videos after 30 minutes of football, they're now probably, I haven't looked because it's a load of shite because Haaland's brilliant and he's going to score loads of goals. But I'm guessing... Nuggets on social media are probably doing the same because he missed a couple of chances and he did look disconnected. Whereas if you look towards Nunes now, I actually think Nunes is a little raw in in a similar way that I think Luis Diaz is a little bit raw, but they both have a really high ceiling. So you can see that these lads have loads of potential. The one thing I would say is Nunes seems to be a little bit more connected with his players now. You can see that when he came on, I think he caused City's backline to drop an extra five yards. He just cr seems to create a little bit of havoc. I don't think he's going to take all his chances, but I think what he's going to do is he's going to occupy defenders. He's looking to run off the shoulder, which Liverpool haven't necessarily been used to. I think Mane and Salah like to do those diagonal runs across lines as opposed to just looking in the space and behind. But I think one thing that Nunes th th did is caused a lot of havoc and that will also then, when he's occupying defenders, allow space for Salah, who looks like he's bang at it. So what what did you make of, I suppose, both big number nines and, and the storylines that are coming off the back of the game? I spoke to, I've spoke to you a few times regarding Haaland and City. Haaland is an outstanding player. Don't get me wrong, he's an absolute monster of a player. For me, he makes good runs. He's not got great movement. His runs are outstanding. Where on the flip side for me, I think Nunes is all over the place and he, he, he'd be a nightmare. You can put Nunes wide left. You can't do yeah. that with Haaland. Haaland is a six foot four focal central striker who will make runs in and behind defenders. He'll hold it up, he'll spin and he'll make runs. Nunes will run right across the lines. I thought Nunes was absolutely outstanding when he come on. He just, as you said, Diaz and uh, Aki just dropped five yards off and were like, wow, this didn't happen with Firmino then. Hmm. But then he was coming short. I think the penalty, he come short, he got the ball, laid it off, spun round, Salah done a bit, cross, header, penalty. He's just kind of me. He's more of an all-round front three player, Nunes, where Haaland is that static number nine where you have to feed him. I think that it's going to take time for Haaland to hit the heights where he hit a Bruce Dortmund. The simple reason is, and this is where I think Man City might, lose a small percentage of of the of what they were because they had like a front six if you like man city had a front six and you'd have Foden, you'd have jesus you'd have mares silver and de bruyne you'd have rod you'd sit in there and you'd have that five rotating and you know you couldn't cope with their movement whatsoever because folding a turn up on the right hand side mares a turn up where he wants and the movement is absolutely killing you can't do that now because not a chance on earth will you see Haaland out on the right wing whipping balls in the box for Maris to get in the end of. And it's going to take City a lot of adjustments. I think that's why they've not had too many games. I think they've been working on 11 v 11 at, at the training ground to try and get him into the, to the way they play. Tank makes a good point. Were you laughing there? Did Tank get a name wrong by any chance? Because I, uh, I was just, really... was just Jesus. So oh. it's a, it was it pre crucifix or after crucifix? <laughs> Jesus, which... he's, a good, he's looking like Jesus at Arsenal, by the way. And that's <laughs> by the way, that's another point. And let's get back onto this Jack Grealish. I'm going to tell you now, he's bang average in that Man City yeah, team. He is struggling big time. Yeah, we yeah. just spoke about this being a glorified friendly. He should have just had the shackles off and just gone and done what he done. I thought he was woeful. He's a £100 million pound player. Man City have made a fuck up in swapping Sterling to get rid of Sterling to get him. They've got rid of him and Jesus or whatever Jimmy wants to call him. They've lost 20 goals <laughs> from him. Jesus. Jesus. They've, they've, lost, they've lost 20 goals from him. They've lost 20 goals from Sterling and they've replaced him with someone who does not suit our Man City play. He is not a dynamic attacking footballer, Jack Grealish. He's nice, pretty on the eye, does little things and likes to just do little lens. That, that's him in a nutshell. He won't score 10 Premier League goals this season. 
It's funny because uh, Gazelle uh, asked us the question, and I'll come to you on this, Jim, off the back of what Tank's saying. Because I, I do agree in that I have this theory of Pep. He likes to make cogs in a machine rather than giving maybe people the flexibility to just go and create and be free. And I think Grealish needs to to have that freedom, whereas I think he's trying to turn him into a different type of player where it's down the line, the cut back, the sh- you know, move it quickly. And, and he still, yeah. like, a, like a Curtis Jones at Liverpool, still takes one or two extra touches and it just slows the play down a little bit. Uh, but Gazelle asks... Off the back of that game, do you see any changes in Liverpool and City's playing styles or tactical tweaks? And I think the big obvious one is is is, is the big number nines. But is there anything, you know, you look at the likes of Jack Grealish trying to find his way into that City team. I think City have lost a few players. Do do you think City maybe are becoming a little bit more predictable with, like as Tank says, Haaland being that more rigid number nine? What did you take from the game? No, I think what I took from the game is that... It, they've gone from having non-traditional number nine to having a traditional number nine. So you've taken the last two or three seasons and you've had Aguero who, who was coming in deep and, and you'd have uh, last season, you'd have the false nine, whether it be Jesus or Sterling or Foden, um, to having a number nine now. And, and you know, he was doing exactly what Tang was saying. He was spinning in into the channels, expecting balls to get played in. Um if they balls get played in, then Grealish and Mares can then come in and, and generate the front three. But their balls weren't getting slid in down them sides because that's not how City have been used to playing. They they take the ball, they recycle, they play it into nine, they get De Bruyne and then pushing up off the off the off the pass back and and then they move forward. So I just think it's just going to take a little bit of tweaking from them just to get used to him. But when you've got full backs of Walker. Cancelo, midfield two of Bernardo Silva, De Bruyne, getting used to them runs and they can just slide them balls in all day. I think you'll then start seeing defences play deeper, just like you said City did. Uh, Haaland can play more as a traditional number nine, get the ball, turn, shoot, score. So I don't I don't think there's going to be too much in, in the tweaking. I just think it's it's just getting used to how people want that ball. One thing I'm starting to see, and this was a question that came in uh, from Zen Way of Life, um, is the impact that the subs could have for, for these teams. What do you think, obviously now we're moving to the five subs, do you think that will make a big impact, Tank, going into this season? What type of gains do you think it brings? And, and do you think it suits the top teams? Because you see some of the talent that came off the bench for both teams yesterday and you're thinking, Jesus, if they're making five of these each game, you know, if you're a visiting team who's struggling for points down the bottom, let's say, for example, if we're talking about a newly promoted side, your beloved Forest, you know, they're coming to, to some of the big boys and they're able to call on some of the embarrassment of riches they have on the bench. Does that give them a bit of an advantage? How do you see it playing out? Yeah, I think it's a massive advantage. I do, I do think a lot of these new rules uh, are like gauge to help the big boys, and I think it's wrong. You know, with Liver, you as you say, look, look at Liverpool's bench now. You know, when when they're all fit, if like if Nunes isn't doing it, he can call on Jota. You know, he's kind of the the forgotten one at Liverpool. He is, yeah. He he is a he's a he's a player. No matter what, whether he could be good, bad, indifferent, he scores. Just scores. So yeah. yeah. So you know, if it's not working, you can get Jota, Firmino, you know, Cavallo, who's, who's an exciting talent. Harvey Elliott, and for me, it just I think he's going to have a huge season. I just think it's kind of like yeah, you know, if you're say for instance you're a fucking a Nottingham Forest who's gone to Anfield and you know you're trying to get a point and you. 70 minutes, it's nil nil, and then all of a sudden they just go bang. Here's five brand new fresh legs. Have some of that. It's kind of like mm, it's a difficult one because you can't say it's not fair, but it's like you know, what's up with the good old fashioned three sub rule, you know, and let a manager dictate which has got to be his three best subs. Yeah, it certainly does feel like you, know, you certainly want to look towards the sideline. You see some of these players come out. You're absolutely knackered. Like imagine, you know, for example, you look at City, City yesterday. Some of the changes that they were able to make. You've had, you've had Grealish trying to pick, pick up little pockets, or you've had Mares, and then all of a sudden, you know, look across to to the bench, and you've got Foden coming on. You're thinking, Jesus Christ, Jim. I suppose when you're you're looking at this, one thing that comes 
off the back of any of these games, well, just in general now, and I'm, I'm thinking this because of the Harlan Nunes situation, but also I've seen something online um, in relation to Liverpool's captain, who weirdly is always a divisive uh, character. It seems a lot of extremes in today's football fandom, as in a player is either a 2 out of 10 or somebody's telling you that he's a 9 out of 10, a 10 out of 10. Is, is reason, debate and analysis now becoming, I suppose, a thing at the oh. past? It's totally oh. gone. Gone. It's just... And, and the issue you've got is everyone wants something to say that makes a difference. And they want something to say where... No one attention, wants to, you mean? You want yeah. They want attention. Yeah, they yeah. just want attention. No one wants to go, you know, pull it, go and go with the flow. No one wants to go with what everyone's saying because you... you, you one of the sheep then aren't you you're just saying what everyone else is saying you've got you've got no opinion so the fact that some people say yeah he's absolutely awful and then some say he's, he's unbelievable is generating them conversations about whoever it is who's saying it so reason debate has long been dead there's, there's no there's no way about it and then you've either got one way or the other and there's no there's no middle ground anymore you can't you can't can't say someone was all right or just steady away. They've all it's, and this is a frustrating thing that everyone wants to to be that person that has made that stand out. And it's I blame Piers Morgan. <laughs> yeah, I can, I'm, I'm happy to blame. Oh, don't know what that was. I, I'm He's happy. listening. He is listening. <laughs> Do you know who that is? That's Bill Gates. Bill, Bill Gates, Gates is listening to this conversation. Tank. <laughs> They've got Amazon on downstairs. Yeah. That, not Amazon. What's it called? I'm yeah, Alexa, yeah, Alexa, Alexa. That's it. Yeah, uh, yeah, Tank. Because uh, before we uh, we move on, I just want to finish on Man United. Um, but I suppose the reason I asked that is Jordan Henderson. I, I seen somebody online give him a two out of ten, and, yeah. and this created this whole story around just throwing mud at our captain. Who I, I don't know. It just it makes me feel uncomfortable when you see stuff like that because he clearly was not a two out of ten. And I just feel like fans have probably gotten to this situation where they've given an opinion years ago on a player and they can't back down. So they just have to, they care more about proving a point in yeah. relation to that player than actually what they're watching on the football pitch. It's it's not good for anyone. No, Jordan Anderson, he does what he says in the tin. He sets, you know, he's, he's brilliant. I have little, you know, I have little gripes about Anderson sometimes where I just, I messaged to use, there was a couple of occasions where if he just played the simple, the simple balls, one was out wide left, and one was to put Salah through. You know, it, the goal scoring chances, and he doesn't he, he doesn't get them right. Mm. But if Liverpool are playing Man City in the Champions League final tomorrow, Jordan Henderson's the first name on the team sheet. Mm. But the simple fact is, is that it's the way he presses, and you're seeing him like screaming at Trent a couple of times in that charity shield. So there's no let up from him. You know, it would be easy for Liverpool to kind of go in the little shell and just say, look, we've had a, a great season last season, but not so great it ended. And can't but you, you've got players like him and your Milners of the world. You would to, they're just like the the he's the bread and butter of Liverpool, but to give him a two out of ten for that on performance, what we produced, the people just have no idea about real football in my opinion. He was brilliant. Yeah. I, I have to agree. I want to come to, to you, Jim, on... We've been uh, talking a little bit about the ever-going, ever um, I suppose, the, the drama of Barcelona Football Club, it seems. I don't know what's going on there, mate. It's, oh it's ab God. absolutely nuts. But um, one of the storylines that's breaking at the moment is that Manchester United are supposedly still not giving up on <laughs> Frankie de Jong. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's unbelievable. It's like a soap opera. But, um, yeah... Not only are they potentially looking to pay huge wages, they're going to also potentially pay the money the Barcelona owe him. Then a transfer fee. What in God's name is going on? A at Barcelona, B at Manchester United. Then how is how are they even contemplating this? It's absolutely nuts. The, I mean, the question you've got to ask is: is is he the player that they they should be want doing this for? Yeah. Yeah, 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 like is is Frankie De Jong? Because if he is, and Ten Hag's that adamant, then the money and that sort of stuff, no issues for me because it's not my money. And I know, you know, Man United are a billion dollar corporation, and they, you know, they they they're not short of cash, no matter how much they pay their directors. The question I would ask is: is that is this a player that I wouldn't be spending all that money on, giving him a whack of seventeen mil plus four hundred and fifty euros a week or whatever it is that they're paying him? So. 
look, that's not my decision. I wouldn't personally because I think, you know, it, it, could you get players of a similar ilk, if not better than Frankie de Jong, who, who give you different dynamics? So I think, yeah, I th- but don't get me on Barcelona. It's just an absolute <laughs> shit show. I have no idea how they're still being allowed to do this. And if Frankie de Jong doesn't go, they can't register Lewandowski or um, the uh, Rafinha. It's just, it's mental. I don't, I don't see how it can keep going on like this. Yeah, something doesn't seem right. What, what, are, what are they, what, what's the saying? What are they smoking over at the Emirates? What are they smoking over at Old Trafford Tank? Yeah. It seems a bit of a, it just, it, well, in general, the carry on is, is bananas. You just look, I mean, I tweeted about this the other day. It was like, Man United, it pains me to say it, and an absolute global giant, probably the biggest club in world football. And, you look how they've been acting the last three or four years in like transfer markets, and it just stinks of desperation so bad. Surely someone there high up must have a brain and just go, look, this finishes. Enough we're enough. going, we're going public. Frankie De Jong is not coming. I seen a quote the other day that if this deal goes ahead, it's close to three hundred million pounds deal for Frankie De Jong to come to Man United. That's his contract for the term of his contract, the fee. I'm actually, I think it's absolutely, it, it's that ridiculous. It's funny that they're going to pay 17 million for Barcelona at home and pay Barcelona the transfer fee. There's not, they're not even so talking about negotiation. Oh, it's, it's like, but then, I mean, you, we haven't brought up what Jimmy put in the, uh, the WhatsApp group before. Yeah. How's Barcelona getting away with this? There's a, the French club, what was the club, Jimmy? Bordeaux. It's Bordeaux. 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 Basically gone tits up and, Barcelona still owe them nine and a half million euro. Yeah, Barcelona, are, it's like Bordeaux so, have been relegated to League Two or League Three. Yeah, the, the third, third, the third division of French football after a financial debt of forty million. Barcelona still owe them nine point six million for the purchase of Malcolm Mal- in two thousand and eighteen. Yet they're still throwing around this imaginary cash for other players. But surely that I mean. FIFA and or whoever should be looking at this and going, we need the ins and outs of absolutely every detail of what you're doing, what you're spending. But then you go back to Barcelona, there's players there like Frankie De Jong, who's owed 17 million, and other players you were getting told you've got to take 50% pay cuts, defer wages, while you've got 11,000 know, of them coming in smoking big cigars on four, five hundred euros, thousand euros a week. You're like, surely this something's got to give here, no? The bubble, yeah, the bubble's got to burst. It's and, got, and, and... got to. The, the other thing I'm looking at, Jim, that struck me, and I, I, this isn't just, we like we, we obviously have uh, our own teams that we support, but just as football fans looking at this, I'm looking at Manchester United and you've seen uh, with the Ronaldo stuff, um, you know, he's coming back in for talks and they fucking brought Fergie back in. Yeah. Right. What? So, All the what? old guard. They'll have a <laughs> skeleton in the, uh, in the hallway. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I just, I'm Fergie looking at this like... and I'm like, <laughs> you know, with Fergie coming back, United fans might not want to admit this, but as brilliant as he was for them, one of the greatest, if not the greatest ever, depending on your own views, he is a shadow that is hanging over that club. And as good as he has been for them, what does that say for the new manager if they're like, look, you know, we're going to bring Fergie in to try and help us persuade Ronaldo? What they should be doing is saying to Ten Hag, tell Ronaldo to sling his hook. You take charge of this situation. Not cutting the legs from under him and bringing in the old manager to try and yeah. you know, convince a player that maybe Ten Hag doesn't even want anyway. So it just seems a bit of a mess. This is where business and football are completely different, isn't it? Because the business owners want Ronaldo to stay because of the financial uh, gain that they get from having Cristiano Ronaldo at their football club. So who are they going to bring out? You know, I'm sure is uh, is is he on the diet board of directors, Ferguson? I know he's he's you know I'm sure he's an ambassador. So you know, I'm pretty sure he's uh, he's on the board as well. So he, they'll be bringing Ferguson back out to to smooth it over the father figure that Ronaldo never had, um, and it, it's just. I don't think Ferguson is hanging over him as a shadow. I think I think they've seen an opportunity to bring him in to for their own financial gain. I don't think it's a footballing thing. I don't think it. I don't think they want him there for a footballing term. I think they want him there for a financial gain. 
What do you think, Tank? Because it remind when I was seeing this, I was they had to stop Liverpool had to stop Shankly coming to the training ground, didn't they? Uh, yeah. All those years ago, and it kind of you know uh, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer used to wheel Ferguson in when things were going bad, and he give the players pep talks and stuff like yeah. that. I, I just feel like if, if United want to progress as a club, that's one of the apron strings that they probably have to cut. But this is this is what we spoke about when uh, Pep and Klopp come into Liverpool. They made a statement. And I think that Ten Hag should have been allowed to make a statement and just say to Ronaldo, you're not needed. You're not needed. He is not Man United's future. But it's kind of like, this is where I, I keep going back. Like, United are an absolute global phenomenon, but they still make, like, schoolboy errors where I think anyone with half a brain of football realises that, really, Ronaldo is not going to be in the future of Manchester United plans. Man United need a rebuild. So a rebuild where a manager should come in and just say, right... We don't want Fergie coming in. The man's an absolute legend, the greatest manager that's ever lived, one of them. And <laughs> you can't keep having them hanging over like this. You know, if there's a problem with Ronaldo, oh, let's get Fergie. Why? I mean, fucking hell, what's the next shout? They're going to end up swapping Ali Maguire for Steve Bruce at West, uh, West Brom now. <laughs> there's going to be a swap deal in that is there to bring him in. Because they're talking about Brian Robson coming in as well with Fergie. Jeez, and, and, you know, coming on like him to give like, it's. Just make some bold decisions. You're a huge club. You're a phenomenally sized club. Make big decisions. What will benefit you? Go. Short term solutions are going to fuck Man United even further. Ronaldo should have been told Ten Hag, you do what you want to do with him. He doesn't want Ronaldo. He's never come out in his I've never seen a press conference where he's gone. I'm. Yeah, I really want to keep him. Hmm. You know, it's it's a bit of a laughing stock if you, if you want me honest opinion. Now, I want to finish because what are we on now? We're on 45 minutes um, and we always like to finish on non-football questions. And Jim, uh, you had uh, wondered, uh, you, you wanted yeah. to discuss and, 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 this, and this is when did things become a thing? So new traditions, yeah. to, uh, tell everyone what so, you're thinking. So it was, my, uh, it was my either best or worst surprise son's birthday on Tuesday. Um, <laughs> he turned two. And in in giving him his gifts downstairs, which you know he had a shed load of, gone are the days where you get two or three presents. Um, we had to, and we had to get our eldest son a couple of presents too. And I was driving to the mother-in-law's because we'd forgotten to get him this football that he wanted, and. It was eight o'clock at night. I'm thinking, why? When did this become a thing of I, you know, getting siblings a present along the lines of someone else's birth? But it was my sister's birthday. I had to sit there jealously looking on as she's opening <laughs> Barbie's dream house and bloody all that. And I'm thinking, fuck, I've got to wait till December for my birthday. Never mind this. So these two, did this birthday presents on birthday presents for the non-birthday kids and Christmas Eve boxes. My my kids get Christmas Eve boxes. They get like nine presents in there: jammers, bottles, toys. It's like it's like two Christmas days, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Like I I got a Game Boy on Christmas, and that was it. Like deal with it and wait for next year. So <laughs> these are like the little traditions that are sneaking in. So what are the new traditions of you lads seeing that sneak in that we never had and you can't get your head around? Tank, you can go first. I know you've got one. Yeah. Firstly, mate, I don't really think your mum and dad liked you. you... <laughs> Listen, I, I, know, I know for a fact my dad definitely didn't. I don't know about my mum. <laughs> my, listen, I'm a, I'm, I think I'm 10 years old than you anyway, but for me, it's this prom. It's like, I know I, I've watched movies when I was young when the proms in America like a half, yeah, you know, loads of bollocks that is. But this new prom now and it's getting bigger. The first I heard about the prom was when Millie, who's 21 in October, so it might be five years ago. And like my missus like, oh, it's Millie's prom. I was like, what the fuck's a prom? It's all they all, you know, they have this thing, they go and have a bite to eat it. Uh, I think they went to Hailston Hall up here, which is a really nice golf place with a hotel. It's like, you know, expensive, nice stuff. I'm like, okay. Uh, she wants a dress. Okay. And then all of a sudden, like, the dress is like a £600 dress. And I'm like, what the fuck is that all about? <laughs> and then it's like a fucking wedding dress. Like, you know, don't get me wrong, they look great. And then, like, my missus is like, oh, Millie wants uh, a pre prom. So this is another thing. They're having a pre prom at ours. I'm like, okay, what's a pre prom? Well, all of her friends come before they go to the prom. And, uh, 
if you wanted the marquee outside, I'm like, what? <laughs> so then you've got to get the marquee. And then as we're getting closer to the prom, they're like, because you've got the marquee, uh, Millie was saying, would you mind having the, uh, the after prom here as well? I think you've been stitched up massively. Here. I think I, so. I <laughs> yeah, I have. So in the end, but, but, but look, so we, and you know, the ads and the fucking, and it was just like carnage. But then Jack had his the other, the, other, the other day, like, and I'm like, I know what's coming here. You know, when he left school and like Jack prominent, we went to Hairsnow, he gets a fucking suit, the suit's there hanging in front of you. He gets this fucking suit. You had to take him into Liverpool, get him a nice designer suit, designer shit, fucking. I'm like, is this some sound of fucking like it's like an expensive thing? And then you go into Hairston Hall. There's people put like kids pulling up in here. And some of the girls what were there with like the dresses were about 40 foot wide. And like they're getting out in fucking limousines and the high. My big bedrooms. fat gypsy wedding. It, oh, honestly, geez. mate, it, it was like that. And I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck even is this? I left school and it was a bottle of fucking cider down to Formby Woods. Get the train. And that was me leaving school <laughs> on the cider. Bang, it's over. <laughs> a, bo- a bottle of cider in Formby Woods. <laughs> I think, yeah, I I think mine. I think mine is um, gender reveal parties. Ah, oh, oh, mate. Yeah. Don't because like, I know. Don't you dare come because I know. You're going to tell me that I do one. Fuck thing, <laughs> you would a million percent do gender reveals. But go on. <laughs> I don't think I would. I think Noreen would probably raise it with me. I think the, 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 missus, the missus would definitely raise it with me. I uh, I personally wouldn't do it. But some of the some of the ones you see these days, like, you know, I'm a sucker for content. But some of the things, I seen one the other day where it was like two dress-up boxers were having a fight. And like one of them got knocked yeah. out. And then the, 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 the gender was revealed as he hit the deck. And I'm just like... What in God's name? And then you've seen ones where like things have gone wrong and the balloon, they let go of the balloon and the balloon <laughs> went up into the sky and they couldn't find out if they had a boy or a girl. The guy's yeah. scrambling up the fence. Yeah, so yeah, gender reveal parties are mine. They can, uh, yeah, they can officially That's, get uh, I give you that, mate. I, I see a lot of them on social media. They're not, I mean, just like people on Lad Bible or whatever content you see. And it's just like, fucking hell, like just... Wait until it's born. Like, has yeah. it got a cock or has it got a fanny? Like, what is it? <laughs> Jesus, that's no, no, that's going to lead us down that, a different path. Don't yeah, get that's another started. show. That that's <laughs> yeah, another that's, show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because you got to wait to see whether they want that cock or fanny. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Right, lads. On that note, we are uh, yeah, we are officially on uh, time up before we go down a very dodgy path. So, uh, lads, thank you as always. Uh, looking forward to next week already. Any final thoughts from either of you before we go? Yeah, I've changed my tune. I think Man City are going to finish second. Liverpool are going to finish first. (laughs) Love it, (laughs) Jim. You're sticking with the original prediction. Sticking with the original, yeah, mate. Yeah, good man. Right. Uh, so with that, oh, uh, quick shout actually. Um, thanks, Jesse Lingard. Video went through the roof last week. I actually don't know oh, what yeah. it finished on, but it was on uh, yeah, tens, it. tens of thousands, and we got loads of. My assumption is, Forest, uh, New Forest listeners uh, to the podcast. So you are very welcome. Uh, it's great to see the growth that we're seeing, not only in downloads, views, but also people interacting with the social feed. So. Um, yeah, there's Bill Gates again. He doesn't want us. He doesn't want us to finish hey, this podcast no. today. He's listening, isn't he? Um, but yeah, welcome to everybody that's new and been getting involved uh, in the podcast. Please keep your feedback coming. If you haven't subscribed on YouTube or to the podcast, please do tell a friend. Or as always, send us your feedback on what you like, don't like, what you'd like to see in future episodes. As we always say, we want this show to be as much yours as it is ours. So keep your feedback coming. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. I'm off for a lie down. I'm amazed that. I managed to get through 53 minutes of that whilst chronically <laughs> hung, <laughs> chronically hung over. So uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your week. Um, look, stay healthy, stay happy, and we will be back with you next week on the Boot Room Podcast. All the best. Cheers, lads. Cheers, lads.